I'm Ian Embry. I'm a pitching instructor here in Colorado Springs, down in Colorado Springs. I've pitched professionally 12 years, and I have a program where I've worked with over 4,000 pitchers nationwide. For the most, for the majority, that have been hiring college guys, pro guys, and, and uh, several high school guys. That, that, that mixing the bunch. Uh, one of the things about me, gentlemen, is I am a mechanical guy. I'm a mechanical analysis dude, but I'm also a velocity guy. I'm big on velocity. When people say, well, just throw a strike and don't worry about your velocity, that's, I don't do that. I'm going to throw it hard in case it is a strike. Right? But here's the thing. The majority of pitchers here in America, young pitch, high school pitchers in America, are inefficient when it comes to their velocity because of their mechanics. We're going to talk about that. Some of the things that you were taught, you probably shouldn't have been taught, and some of the things that you should have been taught, you weren't. For example. How many of you guys were taught to push off the rubber? How many of you guys were taught to really take your glove and really drive it down? How many of you guys were taught to... Something else. I don't think about here. Those are two components that hinder velocity, consistency, and command. Pitching comes down to three elements. Balance timing, direction, and sit. What we're going to talk about here this afternoon is how do we maximize our velocity using much less effort. Some guys throw, have arm speeds that are much faster than the ball is actually indicating, than the pitch is indicating. Velocity and throwing hard are two different things. Throwing hard is just getting a higher number of radar guy. But velocity is based on direction. I've seen more 95 mile an hour. I've seen more 91 mile an hour fastballs get the home plate a lot quicker than the 95 did. See it all the time. It's based on where the ball is released from. Jeremy, come on up. I'm sure what I'm talking about. This is Jeremy Hidalgo it's from Dallas, Texas. Uh, out of all of my students, he's probably one of the best uh, mechanically, sound mechanically, in consistency. <coughs> Jeremy's going to demonstrate a couple things that we're going to talk about as far as arm speed, point of acceleration, direction, and finishing. Okay. Most of you guys have been taught to balance, and when you got to your balance point, you were taught this. How many of you guys are taught this to be the balance point? I mean, this is okay. I, I was. I was taught that. But here's the problem. The minute he gets to this point and tries to go forward, now, is he balanced now? He ain't done baseball yet, so this doesn't mean anything. The first phase of balance is to help the second phase of balance, which is most important is when he lowers his knee to come to a potential energy state, which is there. Notice where he is. Notice how his hand's out of his glove and he's in a balanced state. Now he can just slide his foot to the ball on plate. He's not moving forward. If he moves forward, his arm's going to say, wait a minute, I'm not ready yet. Okay? Go ahead and strike over. When he strides, everybody see where his weight is? Where? Back. If he was taught to push off the rubber, he'd get way out there. If his weight pushes forward, his arm has no time to catch up. The human arm, gentlemen, will only travel at its fastest speed for four inches. That's it. If I took a towel and I'm going to spin it and crack you with it, notice I wouldn't do this. I'm going to spin, pop out front. Same concept here. Well, if his weight's forward, in order to catch up with the body, his arm has to work faster and harder in the back to catch up. Then he's got to throw the baseball. His arm then delivers itself and the pitch. We don't want to do that. This is what we got. We're going to get, we're going to get his weight back. And as he transfers forward, the arm comes along with him. Arm hasn't done anything yet. Once he gets out front, what does he have left over? Four inches. Right? He's now, the ball has come out of his hand while his arm is traveling as fast as speed. We want the baseball to come out of our hand while our arm is traveling as fast as speed. Your arm doesn't travel the same speed the entire time. That's, that's impossible. And, well, unless you have extremely long arms. Because of the, the, the fulcrum and everything, yeah, it may, it may do that. At least longer period of time. 
But his arm will only travel as fast as for four inches, approximately. One four inches to be out front. And if he can keep his weight back and allow his lower half to drive the arm forward, the lower half delivers the arm, then the arm delivers the pitch. I've thrown harder while decreasing the effort. Does that make sense? Logically? Second piece. <laughs> Notice where his glove is. Notice where his back arm is. If I took his glove off, his hands would look almost the same. Equal opposite or scapula loading is, is the technical term. Notice that his thumb is pretty much down. He doesn't do this. A lot of us have taught that, for which I don't know who came up with that, but that's crazy. And the reason it's so crazy is because the body does not want to do this. Velocity is predicated on how far your arm can lean back or lay back. If my arm gets to this position, I can't lay it back. If my thumb stays down, I can lay back and catapult this way. And then, then we got the front side. Many, you said, well, I showed hands earlier. Many of us were taught to take the glove and drive it down. If he drives his glove down, his front shoulder now opens up. See that? He's not going to take the glove to his, his the glove to his chest. He will take his chest out to his glove. Everybody see that? If he, I want you to face this way so everybody can see it. Just the face face this way. You don't have to this way. If he takes his slow motion, takes his glove to his chest, watch his front shoulder. Oh, wait, take my glove. I'm sorry, chest to glove. That, that, that's right. So do it the right way? Yeah, do it the right way. Take your chest to your glove. Takes his chest to his glove. See where he is? His front shoulder never moves. Pulls the glove down, the front shoulder's got to move, now he's opened up. And this hand angle now changes. The third piece of this is extension, or perceived velocity. Now listen to this. Every foot, every 12 inches that I'm closer to home plate, creates a 3 mile per hour illusion to the hitter. <coughs> so if he's to release a baseball out front, let's say he throws the ball at 85 miles an hour, <coughs> If he releases that ball out front, every foot he gets out there is a three mile an hour illusion to hit him. Number one is going to throw the ball harder anyway because he's in a straight line with his front shoulder. And now he's closer to you when he does it. That's why the glove can't move. Something for you to think about when you guys do this is think about putting your chin in your glove. Easy way to think about it. Finally, extension. 78 to 82% of our velocity, 78 to 82% of our velocity occurs in the final phase of the throw. Many of us get to it, many of us, or some of us get through it. Most of us get to us, you get to it, a lot of us don't get through it. My fat, I'll run my fastball up to 101, 102. So if I'll stand, there's no doubt in my mind that I can throw a fastball at 85 from here to there. Well, that's the majority of my velocity. This other stuff was just getting me in a straight line so I can get to that point. Now, stride length. There are people, I heard a guy on YouTube talk about it the other day and I had to turn it off. A lot of people talk about your stride length is the same, of, you know, 100% of your body length. That's, that's ridiculous. I, I guess I had never heard that. Your stride length is almost like your personality. I'm not going to change your stride length unless it causes you to trip or what we call choke. Jeremy, last week or a couple weeks ago, we were, we were doing some work, and one of the things we found out is that his stride can sometimes be too short. What, call, what happens is, is if the stride length is interrupted, gentlemen. If you're running and someone sticks your foot out and you trip and you fall, they've interrupted the stride length. Well, if my stride is too short, I have not interrupted the momentum of the body, and I'm going to get this. I'm going to trip forward. I want to be long enough to where I want to trip forward, but at the same time, not be so long that I can't keep my weight back. The longer I stride, the shorter I get. The shorter I get, the flatter the ball gets. The flatter the ball gets, the farther it travels. Right? That's an issue. So as long as I can keep my weight back, and as long as Jeremy can take his belly button over his knee, he's maximized front side extension. I should almost see the numbers on your jersey. Don't bend the back. We're not bending the back. We're getting so much extension out front that it caused me to eventually go down. I'm throwing the ball out. I'm not throwing the ball down. 
but I go out so far that I eventually go down. Right? How many of you guys feel? Thank you, I appreciate it. Hey, how many of you guys feel two seamers? Almost everybody. When they were taught the two seamer, when you were taught the two seamer, did anyone talk about the hand angle? The manipulation of the hand angle? No. Okay. <clears throat> my my fastball, I got the straightest fastball in here. It's straight as an arrow. But if I was to change my hand angle just slightly, I'm gonna get a lot of movement. The two seam fastball itself is technically straight, unless the hand angle is manipulated. The grip, the, the grip doesn't do anything. It really doesn't. But when that hand angle goes from 12 o'clock to about one, now we we've change some things. When we talk movement, everybody wants to talk about the ball running. You can run the ball you want, and eventually you'll run into a bunch of barrels. That's what will happen. Movement is the ball sinking. The ball has to go down. Move. When you talk to these guys, when you talk to any major scout, they're going to say movement is when the ball sinks. The ball doesn't sink. It'll sink about 550 feet. Ask me how I know. Right? We want the ball to go down with movement. Sinking action. The two-seam fastball typically will always be thrown on your arm side. I'm not going to crossfire. I'm not going to crossfire two-seam unless I'm mad. What I mean is. Whatever side my arm is on is the side I'm going to throw this two seam. If I got a right in the box, I'm going to throw a two seam. I'm going to bear it in on it. I'm going to go down the middle of the plate and let it run in. Let your movement do the work. We don't fall down the middle of the plate. Let the movement do the work. Now, if you want to go in, in, start it in and run farther in. And hopefully, he gets hit. We'll talk about getting hit, people, uh, people getting hit later on in the next segment. But if I'm going to go away from him, I'm going to go to the four seamer. Why? Because a four seamer will start and stop where I want it to. It ain't going to move much. And it's a higher rate of velocity. Four seam spinning versus two seam spinning, the velocity is going to be higher on the four seam. And it's going to go wherever I want it to go. Right? That's effective velocity. Effective velocity, again, is based on where the pitch is thrown. A fastball thrown at 85 in acts 88. A fastball thrown 85 away, act 82. 85 going 85 down the middle of the plate. You change speed simply by changing location. People say, well, you've got to change speeds and change locations. If you change locations, you've already changed speeds. That make sense? Any questions about anything? Gee, nobody's got anything. Does, does any of this not make sense to anybody? I won't be offended. My wife tells me all the time, it doesn't make sense. What, tell me something. What is one thing you guys struggle with the most? Just anybody. What, what's one thing you struggle with mechanically the most? Falling off the mound this way? <coughs> typically, that's, typically that stems from the glove. When, when the glove swings violently, the, the, the momentum can carry you that way. The reason the glove swings is because of its height. If the, this, I'm glad you brought that up. This glove must be as high or higher than my shoulder. If my glove is here when I go to fire, I'm going to do this. But if the glove stays up in a higher position, I can ride it out and I'm going to stay there. Make sense? Anybody else? Not finishing? Now that you understand the definition of finishing, that, that'll probably help. Because in order not to finish, you'd have to stop the body almost. Never stop the throw into the throw stop shoe. Eventually you'll slow down. We'll, when, I, when we get to the mechanical, the throw and mechanical part outside, we'll, we'll talk more about it. Anybody else? Woody, for you, what was, what was the biggest thing that transitioned you from where you used to be, this guy feels like a million, uh, to where you are now, mechanically? Anybody else? Big trouble? Or is there anything that really helped you get better to where you than where you 
get better from where you were to now based on mechanics alone? Anybody have any questions, coaches? Anybody? Comments? All right, we'll talk more about it when we get out to do the mechanical session. Um, and then you'll come back in. We'll, we'll, we'll come back in this room.